Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and welcome to, well, tonight we're going to do something a little bit different here on Vampire Reviews. So instead of simply reviewing a vampire story for you, I am going to read it to you. We will read it together and discuss it as we read it. And the first story we're going to discuss is the classic, the ultimate, the original, the first vampire story of our modern conception of vampires beyond folklore in the West. The Vampire with a Y by John William Polidori. This story was published in 1819, decades before Dracula and Carmilla and all those other classic vampire stories that you well know. You know that old story about how Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein? She was on vacation with her literary bros and they all decided to tell each other ghost stories and this teenage girl sat down and wrote the very first science fiction story in history? Yeah, well there was someone else at that little writing party during the year with no summer and his name was John William Polidori and he happened to be the physician of Lord Byron. So Lord Byron was traveling around Europe as he did and he brought his doctor with him because you know when you're on tour around Europe just you know living your best life of indulgence and vice you gotta have your doctor with you because what if you OD? What if you get syphilis? Have your doctor with you, it's smart. Also, they were kind of like frenemies. So, you know, they got along, travel buddies. So, John William Polidori always wanted to be a writer like Lord Byron. He kind of envied him, he looked up to him, he modeled things after him, but he also kind of hated him, so he wanted to be seen as better than Lord Byron. Ha, <laughs> good luck. So, on this trip, Lord Byron started writing a story. And Lord Byron usually just wrote poetry, right? So he starts writing the story and he gets frustrated. And he's like, I can't write stories. Stories are for suckers. I'm going to stick to poetry. So he abandons his story. And this was in 1816. And Polidori later took Byron's story. And he was like, this story had potential. I, I know where Byron was going with it. What if I wrote it myself and made it about vampires. Because Byron's story wasn't originally about vampires. It was about something supernatural. They were all writing ghost stories, but not, not about vampires. So Polidori took the vague outline of Byron's story and wrote his own story with his own characters. And one of them was a vampire. This vampire is Lord Ruthven, or Ruthven, or Riven. There are many ways to pronounce this name. It's technically a Scottish name, so it should be Riven or Ruven, but most people pronounce it Ruthven, so that's what I'm going to go with. Ruthven is also popular because it kind of sounds like ruthless, but Ruthven is the most common, so that's what I'm going to go with. Lord Ruthven was the name of a character that was in a different story poem thing written by one of Byron's ex-lovers, and she made up this character, Lord Ruthven, to be a Byron insert in her story because she was kind of pissed at him and she wanted to write this like mean story about him. And so Polydori took that name from that character that this lady wrote and he put that character in his story as the vampire with a Y. Spoilers, Lord Rutherin is a vampire. You don't know that when you start reading this story, but I think we all know that now. And for the purposes of us discussing this story as we read it, uh, there's no way I can't not spoil that for you, so. Lord Ruthven is a vampire, and he is the first vampire in literary history that fits our modern vampire tropes. Before Lord Ruthven, all vampires were the kind of folklore creatures that you would bury and then they'd come back from the grave and prey on their family, kind of mindless, soulless ghouls, and then they would return to their grave. Then you'd take the horse out to the cemetery and he'd stomp on the grave and you'd rip it open and shove a brick in the vampire's mouth, chop off its head and cover it with garlic and rebury it. And that would solve your vampire problem or consumption problem or whatever the actual disease was that was going around your village. So beyond folklore, this story written in 1819-ish, it took Polidori a couple years after their whole writer's retreat vacation to actually finish this story. First vampire, the vampire that directly influenced Dracula, the vampire that's influenced every single iteration of 
vampire where you have a vampire pretending to be a normal person and tricking people into not knowing he's a vampire and then, surprise, vampires, you're dead. So interesting story. Polidori wrote this story and he was like writing it mean-spiritedly. He wrote it in like two or three days just to kind of like be pissed off like, ha, I'm putting Lord Byron loosely in my story and I'm making him into an evil monster and that'll show my frenemy. <sighs> Why can't I be as famous as he is? This will make me famous. And then he gave it to his friend slash girlfriend person. And then she gave it to someone and then it got published. And that's not what he wanted, at least not that way, because the way it got published without his permission was with Lord Byron's name as author. And nobody knows why this happened. If someone did it on purpose or if it was just an accident, but Polydori was pissed. Lord Byron was pissed. Lord Byron wrote angry letters and he's like, you know what? I've heard you're publishing this story and if it's good, I don't want to take that credit away from the author. And if it's bad, I don't want to be blamed for it. And Polydori was like, no, it's mine. I want the fame and glory. Why does he always take my glory from me? Oh, such frenemies. And then um, they print a retraction, they publish it, and they're like, oh, right, sorry, John Polydor's the author of this, but it was too late. For decades and decades and into the centuries, people still thought Lord Byron wrote this story. And that was a good thing because that's what made it famous. You have a celebrity writing your story. Of course, people are going to read it and get famous, and that's why the story endured. If it just had a no-name person's name on it, it may have not gotten famous. There's a reason the story sticks with us. But we may have not had that chance to become so attached to it without that snafu. So poor Polydori did not get super famous from this story because he did not get the credit in so many circles. And he eventually drank and gambled himself to death at the age of 25. And he's your doctor. So because this story is published in 1819, that means it's in the public domain, which means I can read it to you here on YouTube without any issues of copyright. Now, this story, because it's a short story, it's about 8,000 words. You can't just buy a book of it. Well, you can because people will self-publish anything nowadays, but usually it's included in collections. So I have it in three versions. This is my favorite version, and this is a recent book, so you can still get this book. This is called The Phantom of the Opera and Other Gothic Tales, so you can tell why I bought this book. And in the table of contents, The Vampire, with a Y, by John Polidori is the first story in here because... It was the first gothic tale, not the very first gothic story ever, but the first really big important one that really fits our idea of gothic. The first gothic story ever was The Castle of Otranto, and that's a lot more like medieval feeling, whereas this is very romantic period, gothic ballrooms and aristocrats and blood-sucking beasts, people falling in love and dying because of it. So this is a great collection. Barnes & Noble put it out in a whole set of collections of public domain stories that they just reprinted with fancy gilt edges and a red ribbon and look at this. Sorry, this is not a book porn video. Okay. The next version I have is in the Vampire Super Pack, which I bought because a friend of mine has a story in here. And this is a collection of public domain stories and new stories by contemporary authors. Over 225,000 words of startling vampire fiction. 42 stories. And this version has the whole story, but also has a couple letters from people that were with Polydori at the time talking about how the story was written and what was going on during that writing trip. So it's got some interesting extras, so it's pretty cool. Lastly, this one's probably my favorite. This is The Undead Before Dracula, Vampire's First Blood, Volume 1, The Vampire Lords. It's a two-volume set. One has stories about male vampires, one has story about female vampires. So, of course, Lord Ruthven is in this story. Edited by James Grant Golden. And the really cool thing about this is that the editor adds in so much context and history and reaction to the story so you can learn a lot more about what was going on with Byron and Polydori and all of that stuff instead of just having the story itself. A lot of good stuff in here. I really like this book. The problem with all of my anthology editions that include the vampire is that they cram so many vampire stories in here that the font is teeny, teeny, tiny, and it's really hard to read. So for our purposes, I'm going to be reading it to you out of a folder. Sorry I'm not holding a prettier book, but it's the story that's important. So without any further ado, and I'm sorry, that was a lot of ado, but context is interesting. 
Here we have The Vampire with a Y by John Polidori. It happened that, in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leaders of the town a nobleman, more remarkable for his singularities than his rank. Vampire singularities? He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently, the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention that he might by a look quell it and throw fear into the breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Oh, how scary. He sounds so intriguing. Those who felt the sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the dead gray eye, which, fixing upon the object's face, did not seem to penetrate and at one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. Oh, this guy sounds so fun at parties. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to violent excitement and now felt the weight of ennui were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. Oh, these poor rich people are so bored that they invite the scary guy with the dead gray eye to their parties. But he is a nobleman, so that makes it okay. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters of notoriety attempted to win his attentions and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. So this was actually the first time that a vampire character had a really pale face that always stayed pale. Before that, in folklore, vampires usually had really ruddy complexions because they were so full of blood. They looked like the dead, but with like red lips and red faces because they were so full of blood and that was gross. But this time he is very tragically pale all the time. And despite that, because women hate pale brooding men, they still went after him. Yeah, you know, everyone likes a pale brooding man. Of course they went after him. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster shown in drawing rooms since her marriage, threw herself in his way, and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice. Though in vain. Oh, he's too cool for women who throw themselves at him. Makes him even more desirable. When she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unparalleled impudence was baffled, and she left the field. Slut-shaming in this is strong, though, I mean, she's married, so I guess she's an adulteress, and that's pretty impudent. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him. Yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to the virtuous wife and the innocent daughter, that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. Oh, so he's sly about it. He doesn't like the wives that throw themselves at him, but he likes the virtuous wife and the innocent daughter. But he's sneaky. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue. I'll bet he did. And whether it was that it even overcame the dread of his singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, he was as often among those females who form the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues, as among those who sully it by their vices. Oh, so he's an equal opportunity vampire. He likes the innocent ones and the viceful ones. And really likes the ladies in general. About the same time, there came to London a young gentleman of the name Aubrey. He was an orphan left with only a sister in the possession of great wealth, by parents who died while he was yet in childhood. Left also to himself by guardians who thought it their duty merely to take care of his fortune, while they relinquished the more important charge of his mind to the care of mercenary subalterns, he cultivated more of his imagination than his judgment. Okay, so we have a rich but naive and dreamy young man. So gothic. He had, hence, that high romantic feeling of honor and candor which daily ruins so many milliners' apprentices. People who make hats are too honorable, I guess. He believed all to sympathize with virtue and thought that vice was thrown in by providence merely for the picturesque effect of the scene as we see in romances. So 
Evil isn't real, it's just, you know, tossed in there to make things look better. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes, which were as warm, but which were better adapted to the painter's eye by their irregular folds and various colored patches. All right, so this guy's got some privilege. He's like, poor people aren't really suffering. They're just more picturesque because they make better paintings. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon entering into the gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving which should describe with the least truth their languishing or romping favorites. Oh, this is so cynical. Yes, mothers are going to find this hot rich guy and lie to him about their favorite girls to try to get him to marry them. The daughters, at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. Oh, so he's one of those guys. Everyone sucks up to him and now he thinks he's awesome. Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that, except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered, not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life for any of that conjuries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes from which he had formed his study. What? Real life's not like books! The horror! Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams— when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. I was about to give up on the romantic notions of romantic life being romantic until a vampire came into my path. Aubrey watched him, and the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself, who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit assent to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact, allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered its propensity to extravagant ideas, he soon formed this object into the hero of a romance, and determined to observe the offspring in his fancy, rather than the person before him. Don't you hate it when you, like, meet a vampire and you're like, he's so aloof and reserved, he must be awesome, and you just run with that and think that about him and just think he's so awesome instead of actually getting to know him as a person? But that's what the vampire wants you to think. Or does he? Perhaps the vampire just wants to be known for who he really is. It is the vampire's plight. He became acquainted with him paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognized. Go, Aubrey. Getting in there, doing the thing that the ladies can never do with Lord Rutherford? You go. You got this guy. He gradually learned that Lord Rutherford's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found from the notes of preparation in Blank Street that he was about to travel, desirous of gaining some information respecting the singular character, who, till now, had only whetted his curiosity. He hinted to his guardians that it was time for him to perform the tour, which for many generations had been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged and not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies whenever scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subjects of pleasantry or of praise according to the degree of skill shown in carrying them on. So in oldie times, if young men were too innocent, they would go on a trip to go out into the world and learn how to be a lot less innocent. So that way, whenever people were joking about raunchy stuff in their presence, they weren't like, oh, the horror, that's not what they taught me in church. And they could go out and like get all sinful and smoke some opium and go to some bordellos. And then they could be like, I can make raunchy jokes in the drawing room too, because far be it from me to not be like everyone else. His guardians consented, and Aubrey, immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Rutherford, was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Oh, so instead of just stalking him across Europe, you can actually travel with him. Go, Aubrey, you are so obsessed with this guy. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it. Oh, Aubrey, you are so into this guy. And... In a few days, they had passed the circling waters, which means they've left England and gone to Europe. Hitherto, Audrey had had no opportunity for studying Lord Rutherford's character, and now he found that, though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the apparent motives to his conduct. 
He's so mysterious and intriguing. His companion was profuse in his liberality. The idol, the vagabond, and the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. Oh, he's so generous. He's, he's given out alms to the poor. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous reduced to indignance by the misfortunes attendant even upon virtue that he bestowed his alms. These were sent from the door with hardly suppressed sneers. But when the prolificate came to ask something, not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust or to sink him deeper into his inequity, he was sent away with rich charity. Oh, Aubrey, you're such a snob. He's like, you should only give charity to the good homeless people, not to the people who are going to spend it on alcohol and drugs. Tsk, tsk, naughty Lord Ruthven. Why don't you give money to the people that are like tragically homeless? So far, I, I'm on the vampire's side here. But I have the feeling that when this was written, nobody thought it was a good thing to fund the ways of the poor that would make them worse, like to fund addicts' addictions and stuff. So it's probably supposed to make Lord Ruthven look bad and not like Jesus and Jesus Christ superstar. This was, however, attributed by him to the greater importunity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indignant. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship which was still more impressed upon his mind. All those upon whom it was bestowed inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and most abject misery. Oh, so Lord Rutherford is funding the vice of the viceful. He's like, here, take my money, go buy more opium, and smoke yourself to death. So vampiric. But the fact that he's a vampire that gives to charity in the first place, which was, you know, a thing that a lot of people did back then. It was like a hobby. It was just expected of you in society. We don't see that a lot with vampires nowadays. At Brussels and other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companions sought for the centers of all fashionable vice. But Aubrey, isn't that... Why you went on this trip to become a little more viceful? Aren't you supposed to be going to brothels with this guy? There, he entered into all the spirit of the faro table. He betted and always gambled with success, except where the known sharper was his antagonist. And then he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face, with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of a cat whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. Okay, now he's starting to sound more evil. So when Rutherford is gambling against someone who he knows is going to rip him off, a card sharp, someone who's going to like steal his money and trick him, he lets them win. But when he's gambling against someone who really needs money, someone who's like trying to raise money for a new pair of shoes, he, he just like wipes the table with them. So yeah, he, he's sounding a bit sadistic now. In every town, he left the formerly affluent youth torn from the circle he adored cursing in the solitude of a dungeon the fate that had drawn him within the reach of this fiend, whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute, hungry children without a single farthing of his late immense wealth, wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy their present craving. It's interesting to me that the story is having such sympathy upon fathers who gamble their fortune away, even if they're gambling against a vampire who's sadistically cheating them. It's still interesting that they're not like, well, the father shouldn't have gambled in the first place. We're, we're supposed to be sympathizing with this poor father and their doe-eyed children. I'm not saying that because they don't deserve sympathy. Yes, gambling is addiction and addiction is difficult to manage. But I would think that in the 1819, they wouldn't sympathize with that. So it surprises me. Yet, he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost to the ruiner of many the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent. This might but be the result of a certain degree of knowledge, which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all and did not tend to his own profit. But he delayed it. 
That's because you're in love with him, Aubrey. You don't want to be like, hey, dude, your gambling habits are ruining people and making guilty people profitable because you steal all the money from the starving children and then just lose it to the card sharps. But you don't want to say that because you love him and you don't want him to like you less. For each day, he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. Yes, Aubrey, have a heart-to-heart with your vampire boyfriend, Travel Buddy. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruthven, in his carriage, and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eyes spoke less than his lip, and though Aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he obtained no greater gratification from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery, which, to his exalted imagination, began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. You are so into this guy, Aubrey? They soon arrived at Rome. And Aubrey, for a time, lost sight of his companion. Oh, I bet you were miserable. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess, whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. Oh, so while Ruffin's hobnobbing with society, Aubrey's off interested in archaeology. Oh, apparently he does have some hobbies beyond being obsessed with vampires. What must that be like? Whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had been before entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him sufficient reason for the belief. His guardians insisted upon his immediately leaving his friend, and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious, for that the possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his licentious habits more dangerous to society. Ooh, intriguing. It had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred for her character, but that he had required to enhance his gratification that his victim, the partner of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. In fine, that all those females whom he had sought, apparently on the account of their virtue, had, since his departure, thrown even the mask aside, and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. (gasps) This is written in such old-fashioned language that I can't help but interpret it. So, ever since Lord Ruthven left England, all those ladies he was talking to turned out to be slutty. And they seemed virtuous back when he was talking to them, but since he's left, they've all gone slutty. And that must mean he's at fault. That must mean he is a bad person, and therefore Aubrey's step-parents, his guardians, are like, you need to get away from this guy. I'm sure this is just breaking poor Aubrey's heart. Aubrey determined upon leaving, one whose character had not yet shown a single bright point upon which to rest his eye. Oh no, Aubrey, are you over him already? He resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether, proposing, in the meanwhile, to watch him more closely and to let no slight circumstances pass by unnoticed. He entered into the same circle and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavoring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented. In Italy, it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society. He was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret. But Aubrey's eye followed him in all his windings, and soon discovered that an assignation had been appointed which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent though thoughtless girl. Losing no time, he entered the apartment of Lord Ruffin and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time that he was aware of his being about to meet her that very night. Oh, Aubrey, you're so jealous he's going after this girl when he was supposed to be your vampire. I joke, but still, the way Aubrey was obsessed with this guy, I can't help but want to ship them. Lord Ruthven answered that his attentions were such as he supposed all would have upon such an occasion, and, upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her, merely left. (laughs) Of course I'm not going to marry her. I'm like Don Juan. I just seduce girls. It's okay. We do that in oldie times. Aubrey retired, and, immediately writing a note to say that from that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship on the remainder of the proposed tour, he ordered his servant to seek other apartments and calling upon the mother of the lady, informed her of all he knew, 
not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. See, Aubrey just got one letter from his guardians about like, hey, this guy you're obsessed with turned all these girls into slutty girls, and he's like immediately believing it. I'm glad the Me Too movement worked back then too. Save your girls from vampires. The assignation was prevented. Lord Ruthven next day merely sent his servant to notify his complete assent to a separation, but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by Aubrey's interposition. <laughs> Rutherin's like, fine, I won't seduce this girl, but not because you told me not to. I just, I'm over her. Foiled again. Having left Rome, Aubrey directed his steps towards Greece, and crossing the peninsula soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that, apparently ashamed of chronicling the deeds of freemen only before slaves, had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil or many-colored lichen. So Aubrey is a would-be archaeologist. I guess once the vampire leaves you life, you have to fill the void with something. What's more ancient and intriguing than a vampire? Grecian ruins. Under the same roof as himself existed a being, so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed the model for a painter wishing to portray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful in Mohammed's paradise. Save that her eyes spoke too much mind for anyone to think she could belong to those who had no souls. She's so perfect and beautiful and angelic, except she actually has a personality. As she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mountain's side, one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties, for who would have exchanged her eye? Apparently, the eye of animated nature, for that sleepy, luxurious look of the animal suited but to the taste of an epicure. The light step of Ianthe, oh, she does have a name, often accompanied Aubrey in his search after antiquities. And often would the unconscious girl, engaged in the pursuit of a cashmere butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form. Oh, she's so innocent of how hot she is that sometimes she just, like, flaunts it. This is how you can have a hot girl actually be desirable to an upstanding person like Aubrey because she's not aware of how hot she is, so therefore she's not slutty and it's okay. And also she's Greek, which makes her exotic and foreign, so therefore, you know... Also okay, because she's not constrained by English society rules. Floating, as it were, upon the wind, to the eager gaze of him who forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost effaced tablet, in the contemplation of her sylph-like figure, often would her tresses falling as she flitted about exhibit in the sun's ray such delicately brilliant and swiftly fading hues it might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of a passage in Pisanius. He's like, I'm trying to study her, girl, but your hair is just too beautiful that I keep forgetting what I'm reading because you're just so hot, but it's okay because your hair is pretty. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel but none can appreciate? <laughs> Polydori's like, do I really have to write about this? Writing's hard. I'm not Lord Byron. Lord Byron would have described the charms, Polydori. It was innocent youth and beauty, unaffected, by crowded drawing rooms and stifling balls. You see, she's not like the other girls. Not like those girls in the ballrooms who are just chasing after men. She's pure and really hot because she wears looser clothing. Whilst he drew those remains of which he wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil in tracing the scenes of her native place. Oh, so Aubrey is also a talented artist. I thought they said he had no talents at the beginning. This guy is pretty accomplished. Uh, you know, I can't draw ruins. She would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colors of youthful memory the marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy. And then, turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind, would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse. Oh, I like this girl. She likes scary stories. Her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of Aubrey. And often, as she told him the tale of the living vampire who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties, forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months, his blood would run cold, whilst he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies. 
He's like, <laughs> vampires aren't real. That's just like a superstitious Eastern person story. And Ianthe's like, no, my nursemaid told me it. I believe it. But Ianthe cited to him the names of old men who had at least detected one living among themselves after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. And when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them with grief and heartbreaking to confess it was true. So if I just say, I don't believe in vampires, they're not real, they're not real, one will come along and prove it to me that it's true. I gotta get on this. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of Lord Rutherbin. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though at the same time he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Rutherbin. Interesting that the setup in this story is having a Greek foreign Eastern person describing a legend of vampires as if she's citing folklore, but having it match this new version of vampire that was invented for this story. So instead of her just talking about the actual real folklore, she's talking about a made up folklore that works with what we've got going on here. And we see this trope a lot in other vampire stories that were influenced by the vampire with a Y, where you have the Eastern peasant person telling the Western English person, no, vampires are real. I'm superstitious and I believe in them. And the Englishman's just like, pshaw and poppycock, you fool, they aren't real. And then it turns out he's wrong and oh, something about English hubris of the educated world and nature. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears. Though, at the same time, he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Ianthe, her innocence so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance won his heart. She's not like the other girls who are just pretending to be virtuous. She actually is pure, like she was born sexy yesterday. And while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits marrying an uneducated Greek girl, <laughs> imagine <laughs> I would marry a simpleton, a peasant, when I'm so English. Still, he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her and, forming a plan for some antiquarian research, he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained, but he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Ianthe was unconscious of his love. Yeah, right, like she can't tell. She must be really dumb. Maybe that's it. Maybe she's just not smart. And was ever the same frank infantile being he had first known. Oh my gosh, this is just getting creepy. She's so innocent and childlike. She's perfect for me to lust after because she's not like the other girls who actually have sexual agency. Oh, the gothic. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she had no longer anyone with whom she could visit her favorite haunts. Whilst her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time, she had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with several present, affirmed their existence. Pale with horror at the very name. She's like, see, Aubrey, I told you they were real. Soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged him not to return at night, as he must necessarily pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain after the day had closed upon any consideration. <gasps> the haunted forest. They described it as the resort of the vampires in their nocturnal orgies, and denounced the most heavy evils as impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of their representations and tried to laugh at them out of the idea, oh, simple peasants believing in haunted forests. But when he saw them shudder at his daring thus to mock a superior infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, 
He was silent. Thank you, Aubrey, for not mocking the peasants to their faces. That's, it's a little bit nice of you. Next morning, Aubrey sent off upon his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host, and was concerned to find that his words, mocking the belief of those horrible fiends, had inspired with them such terror. They're like, oh, Aubrey, oh shit, Aubrey, you gonna die. When he was about to depart, Ianthe came to the side of his horse, and earnestly beg of him to return ere night, allowed the power of these beings to be put in action. He promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research that he did not perceive that daylight would soon end. As you do, all the peasants are like, don't come back after dark. And he's like, I promise. And then he's like, where the, did the day go? These artifacts are so interesting. Or maybe I was just so busy fantasizing about Ianthe and her innocent, childlike, infantile, fairy-like form. It's probably the woman's fault. That in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He's talking about a cloud, and it's, it's going to rain. You know, Polydor, you could have just said he saw a rain cloud, but no, he had to say it that way. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay, but it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets. Night begins, and ere he had advanced par, the power of the storm was above. Its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick, heavy rain forced its way through the canopying foliage, whilst the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly, his horse took fright, and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found, by the glare of lightning, that he was in the neighborhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself up from the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled, exultant mockery of a laugh, continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled, but roused by the thunder which again rolled over his head, he, with a sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone whom he immediately seized when a voice cried, Again baffled! Is that like the first line of dialogue in this entire book? To which a loud laugh succeeded, and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled, but it was in vain. He was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, and kneeling upon his breast, had placed his hands upon his throat. When the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him, he instantly rose and, leaving his prey, rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches as he broke through the wood was no longer heard. The storm was now still and Aubrey, incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered, the light of their torches fell upon the mud walls, and the thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire of Aubrey, they searched for her who had attracted him by her cries. He was again left in darkness. But what was his horror, when the light of the torches once more burst upon him, to perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless corpse. He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a vision arriving from his disturbed imagination, but he saw again the same form when he unclosed them, stretched by his side. In case that language was a little too archaic, they just brought in Ianthe's dead body and laid her next to him. And, and he's a bit upset. There was no color upon her cheek, not even upon her lip, yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of teeth, having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying simultaneously, struck with horror, A vampire! A vampire! 
A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions, now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was benumbed and seemed to shun reflection and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger of a particular construction which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties, who had been engaged in the search of her whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries as they approached the city forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible. Yes, Polydori, don't, don't bother describing their grief. Lord Byron would have described their grief. But when they ascertained the cause of their child's death, they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the corpse. They were inconsolable. Both died broken-hearted. Yes, her parents dropped dead at the sight of her body that they knew was attacked by a vampire. What vampire? We don't know. Aubrey could not see the person, but he was superhumanly strong and threw Aubrey around. And there were teeth marks on her neck, not fang marks. Interesting thing about this story, the vampires don't have fangs, just teeth. Poor Aubrey, first your vampire boyfriend turns out to be a jerk, and next your childlike girlfriend turns out to be dead. And then both her parents drop dead at the sight of it. Oh, gothic. We are about halfway through this story, and we will continue the rest of it next time on Vampire Read-Throughs. Thank you for joining me, and thank you to my Patreon patrons for supporting all my videos. If you enjoyed this read-through and are looking forward to the second half of the story, which I will be releasing very soon, let me know what other vampire stories you would like to read together. In times of trouble, in times of woe, in times of gothic need, just remember you should always ask yourself, what would Lord Byron have done? Well, Polydor, he would have described the grief and the love and all those other feelings you're like, why should I bother describing this? Anyway, can't wait to read the rest of this story with you. Thanks again for watching and good night.